circumstances that the Jewish people were in. Along with it, he knew the customs and traditions. He knew what the prophets said. He knew about the Old Testament and the speaking of the Messiah and his coming. So he was not an uneducated man. He knew these things. And so Paul had been arrested. He had been sent to Caesarea Philippi. And there he asked that he would go to Rome or that he would stand before the Roman authorities. And so as he stood before the Roman authorities, Festus, he didn't know what to do with him. He couldn't find a charge against him. So he called upon King Agrippa, the Jewish leader, and said, Hey, why don't you listen to Paul and tell me what I need to write to Caesar so that when we send him on to Caesar, as he's requested, there'll be a reason. Because right now, there's no reason. I can't find any guilt in this man. There is no law that he's broken, and yet I've got to write something to Caesar, otherwise there's going to be mud on my face. So he turns to Herod Agrippa to be able to listen to Paul, and Agrippa is very willing and interested to hear him. And so Paul begins his address to King Agrippa, and he basically uh, gives him a compliment And he also uh, connects with him almost immediately. So let's look at some of these verses here. Uh, Verse number 1 of chapter 26. Then Agrippa said to Paul, you are permitted to speak for yourself. So Paul stretched out his hand and answered for himself. I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because today I shall answer for myself before you concerning all the things of which I am accused by the Jews especially because you are an expert in all customs and questions which I have to do with the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to hear me patiently. My manner of life from my youth, which was spent from the beginning among my own nation at Jerusalem, all the Jews know. They knew me from the first, if they were willing to testify, that according to the strictest sense of our sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. And I now stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers. To this promise are twelve tribes earnestly serving God night and day, hope to attain. For this hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused by the Jews. Why should it be thought incredible by you that God raises the dead? He goes on, Indeed, I myself thought I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. This I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests, and when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly enraged against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. So here we have Paul as he stands before King Agrippa, And he gives his personal testimony. Now, for us, this is the third time that we've heard Paul's testimony. And you say, my goodness, Pastor, what more can you speak about his testimony that you already haven't said? Well, we're going to look at, again, what was it that made Paul so persuasive that day? What made him nearly persuade Agrippa to even become or even think about becoming a Christian. The first thing I want us to look at is that Paul was grace-filled. As we look at our lives, we have to ask ourselves this question, are we grace-filled? Notice what he says to King Agrippa in verse 9. Indeed, I myself thought I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. I too, like you. You Notice that? Paul is saying, look, we are not much different. You want to go after the Jews, and you have done so. So did I at one time. You see, Paul was able to realize that his sin was no greater, no different than King Agrippa, and Agrippa's sin was no different nor than his. How often in our lives do we tend to think that our sin really isn't that big a deal. Or we are not as much sinners as the person that we're talking to. How often do we think that we and our sin is much less than the people that we are really angered with? 
Have you been there? Have you been there where you just kind of think, you know, I'm not that bad because I know so-and-so. Been there, done that? You see, Paul was a man that was grace-filled because he knew how long-suffering God was with him. Turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1. Here in this scripture, we're going to be looking at verses 15 and 16. Uh, Again, Paul is saying, look, this is what I was. This is what I did. Paul did not lessen his sin. He did not ignore the sin that was in his life. He understood how exceedingly sinful he was as a man. Therefore, he was able to dispense grace to those that were hearing him. 1 Timothy 1 verse 15, it says, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am what? Oh, okay, how many of you would say, I am the chiefest of sinners. I am the worst of the worst. There isn't anybody more sinful than me. You're struggling with that right now, aren't you? Because you're thinking of politicians, aren't you? (laughs) You're thinking of other people around you. You're thinking of somebody on the assembly line. You're thinking of somebody else who is just doing evil and wickedness. And you're saying, you know what? They are a real bad sinner. But me, not that bad. Not that bad. Paul says he was the chief of sinners. However, for this reason I obtained mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show all long suffering. As an example or as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. If God can save me, he can save anybody. Do you believe that God can save the most awful sinner that you know. The most wicked man or woman in the entire world. Think of on the world scale and people that have done things. Do you believe that God could have saved Jeffrey Epstein? Wait a minute. He was really bad and wicked. Well, you know what? Are we any different? No. You see, if you want to be a persuasive Christian, a persuasive witness, we must be able to see the depth and width of our sin. We must understand the abundant grace that God has given to us and realize, my goodness, without His grace, there would be no hope in my life because I am a chief of sinners. Paul, he said, What did he do? (laughs) He tried his very best, like King Agrippa, to stop the spread of Jesus of Nazareth. He did his very best in Jerusalem and beyond Jerusalem. He carried out those orders to go and persecute the Christians. He would actually cast his vote in order to execute Christians, as he did Stephen. He would take either a white stone or a black stone. The black stone was for condemnation. The white stone was for acquittal. And he would throw that stone into the basket along with others. And then they would determine whether or not that Christian should live or die. He did everything he could to convince them or bring them to a point where they would actually revoke Jesus' name. And I am sure that Paul was successful with some Christians. I bet you he was. They didn't want to see their kids pulled away from them. He was not a nice man. But yet, folks, he realized the depth of his sin. Paul also knew the riches of Christ's grace as well. Uh, Here in verse number 18 of 
Acts 26. And again, as we read about this, I'm going to just say, hey, you know the testimony of Paul already. So let's take a look at verse 18, what God said to him. He was to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Paul knew the riches of Christ's grace because he went from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to the power of Christ. He was a man that had been changed by Christ alone. And he knew that he would be still that old man apart from the riches of Christ. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 8 says this, To me, who am less than the least of all saints. Talk about a self-esteem issue. I am, look what he said, I am less than the least of all the saints. Now, does that not go against today's idea? You're a good person, right? You should never think of yourself as less than. What did Paul just say there? To me, who am less than the least of all the saints. He says, there is nobody lower than me. I recognize my depravity. I recognize my sinfulness. I understand that there is nothing good in and of myself. Paul had a self-esteem problem. No, he was grace-filled because he understood his true condition. Do we understand our true condition? Do we understand that we are not good in and of ourselves? And you say, Pastor Craig, the majority of people sitting here would agree with that probably. But there are others here who, you know, you're really struggling. You're really thinking, wait a minute, but I need somebody to tell me how good I am and how not a sinner I am. Well, you will not be a persuasive witness for Jesus Christ if you don't come to the realization of the depth of your sin. Turn me to Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. If there is any example of this that's better than this one, I, I struggle to find because it's just so pointed and so clear. Verse number 9. Also, Jesus, he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Let's reread that. Jesus spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were good, that they were better than others, that they were not that bad, that they were patting themselves on the back, look how good I am. That's what Jesus was talking to, or who he was talking to, and they despised others. I cannot be a persuasive witness for Christ if I despise other people. I I can't. I must understand the depth of my sin. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified, declared righteous, rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Look at me. Look how good I am. Look at all the things that I have done. And we pull out, and we're so quick to pull out of our resume of how good we are. 
what that does is causes us to despise others, which will keep us from being a witness to those who are apart from Christ. Folks, we need to be grace-filled Christians. We need to be filled with the grace of Christ, the riches of Christ, and what that means to us. Because if we are not, then we are going to be those who will be condemning those around us and not being concerned at all for the souls of those who are apart from Christ. It's easy, isn't it, to get an uppity look in our eyes and to our nose Telling other people how righteous our side is versus the other side. So easy for us to elevate ourselves above others while missing the mark of what really changes a person. When Paul stood in front of King Agrippa, was he concerned about changing his morality or introducing him to Jesus Christ? Was he concerned about the laws of the land or the law of Christ being in his heart so that he would become a changed man, a changed leader, a leader who is directed by God rather than directed by his own desires? Folks, there is nothing that will change a person more than a relationship with Jesus Christ. Because when a person comes into relationship with Jesus Christ, they begin to change their morality. They can begin to change their philosophy. If it's genuine and true, there will be things that will change that you can't even keep up with. But yet we are so focused on trying to change people outwardly before we ever consider about the inward change that they need. We need to be grace-filled Christians realizing the depth of our need so that we can share the depth of their need of Jesus Christ. And you're saying, I can hear it, Pastor Craig, but we got to speak the truth because grace is tolerant. You're being too tolerant. That's the second one. If we're going to be a persuasive witness, we not to only be grace-filled, but we need to be truth-filled. And that's what Paul talks about here. Let's see what he does with King Agrippa when he stands before him. Paul, as he was standing before Agrippa, he knew the message that he needed to hear. He says to him, as we read, uh, King Agrippa, uh, you do believe in the prophets, right? You do believe in the scriptures. And Paul pointed in Acts 26, verse 22, Therefore, having obtained help from God to this day, I stand witnessing both to small and great, saying no other things than those which the prophets and Moses said would come, that the Christ would suffer, that he would be the first to rise from the dead and would proclaim light to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. I want to start with that, and we're going to hit another truth here in a moment. Do you know the truth of the gospel? Do you know what the gospel is? You see, we got to take it back to a clean canvas as a painter. God, when he began this world, it was as if he had a clean canvas upon which he was going to take the brush strokes of his hand and he was going to begin to paint this picture of who and how man would be saved. In Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, he made the first brush stroke stroke towards salvation. And it would be easily overlooked because it just is a brush stroke on the pages of God's word. It seems so small and insignificant that most people will drive right by it. They'll look at it and say, what's that on his canvas? Is that important? The words that he gives us are these, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. That was the brush stroke. That brush stroke was so seemingly tiny, but yet it was pointing to man's eventual Messiah. We can go throughout scripture and he takes another brush stroke And he reveals in Genesis 22, 18, where and from whom this Messiah would come. He's speaking to Abraham, and he said this. 
in Genesis 22, verse 18. In your seed, Abraham, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. This Messiah was going to come through Abraham's lineage. And with it, God would also have a picture within that same chapter of Genesis 22 where God would take Abraham and say, take your son, your only son, up onto the mountain. And there I want you to sacrifice your one and only son. Now to Abraham, he didn't know John 3.16. Abraham had no idea of Calvary. Abraham had no idea that Jesus Christ would come and die and be buried and rose again. But yet God, with another brushstroke, was showing him, look, I'm going to reveal to you how this Messiah will come, what he will do. And as Isaiah or Isaac or Abraham took that knife and was ready to plunge it into his son, his only son Isaac, the angel of the Lord stopped him. We know that story. We're glad that he stopped. But do you think Abraham knew he was going to be stopped? No. And there behind him in the thickets was a male lamb. Well, we know as Christians that Jesus Christ would have a thorny crown placed upon him, his head, the perfect lamb of God. But yet, in the story, we had no idea that that is what it pertains to. And yet, God would take the canvas and continually put new strokes, new paint, new colors into it, defining more and more and more. Isaiah 7, 14, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. You said, I didn't think it was Christmas yet. Folks, the brush strokes of God throughout Scripture, throughout the Old Testament, Paul was laying them out to King Agrippa. These were the Scriptures that King Agrippa knew and heard and was supposed to know. And Paul was saying, look, his name will be Emmanuel. And do we know anybody at the time of Paul whose name was Emmanuel? Uh, I think Matthew chapter 1 speaks about, and he shall save his people from their sin, and his name shall be called Emmanuel. Paul was laying it out for Agrippa, saying, Hey, look, Jesus Christ is the Messiah. Not only his name, not only that he would be born of a virgin, but we had more and more brushstrokes. Isaiah 53. How can we forget Isaiah 53? He would be a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. And so as Paul is speaking to King Agrippa, he is laying it out that the Messiah that he was talking about and the Messiah and why he was being persecuted, the reason he was standing there was because he taught that Jesus Christ was the Messiah who went to the cross, the hill of Calvary, he was put to death, he was buried, and he rose again. Do we know the message of salvation? Do we understand what that means? If we want to be persuasive to others, we need to know the message. We need to understand the message and what it means to us. We need to know the truth of the message Which brings us to this point here about the truth back in Acts 26. Talk about one of the most clear uh, descriptions of salvation. He stands before King Agrippa and look at verse number 20. But declared first to those in Damascus and in Jerusalem throughout all the region of Judea and then to the Gentiles that you should, they should what? Repent. Turn to God and do works befitting repentance. He stood before King Agrippa and he didn't say, Oh, King Agrippa, God loves you. God loves you. God loves you. He said to King Agrippa, Repent of your sin. Turn to God, meaning turn away to from yourself. And then go and do works befitting repentance. That actually show that you are a follower of Jesus Christ. Because those who follow Christ 
look like Christ or act like Christ. You see, Paul was not afraid to speak the truth to King Agrippa. He didn't hold back. So when we talk to those who are apart from Christ, we must deal with sin. We must let them know that the reason why they need a Savior is because they are a what? Sinner. And sometimes that's hard for people to see because we want to justify sin today, don't we? We want to change that which God calls evil, and we want to change it into something that says, but it's okay now. It's a cultural thing. My God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. What he said was holy is still holy today. That which he says is right is still right today. That which is wrong is still wrong today. Paul, being one of the great evangelists of our time, he was basically told, you must be mad. You must be insane. Not only was Paul grace-filled and truth-filled, but he was also fruit-filled. I was trying to think of something that would be filled. So I thought, hmm. Fruit. Why? Because by your works you are known. Uh, There in verse number 19. Therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. God called. God said, I do. Don't be only hearers of the word, but doers of the word. Be careful that you don't deceive yourself. And so Paul was not just a person who was grace-filled and truth-filled, but he was fruit-filled. He actually lived the life that Christ wanted him to live. We are to be salt and light in this world. Uh, Turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Again, very familiar, the Sermon on the Mount, verse number 13. These are the words of Christ himself saying to each of us, this wasn't to his disciples or the apostles, this was to each of us. You are salt, the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a bush basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Folks, if we want to be persuasive in our testimony, then we must be living as Christ. We need to be living examples of what a Christian should be. I need to be that changed and new person, not hot and cold when I want to, when I don't want to, but I need to have a consistent testimony and witness for Jesus Christ. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 1, imitate me as I imitate Christ Jesus. He gives us a pattern. Paul was saying, let me tell you all these facts. Let me tell you all these biblical things, and you need to receive Christ. But my life doesn't reflect that. If you are here today, and you say, you know, I'm just a grumpy person. I I find myself being kind of bitter or kind of being just grumpy. I I don't know how many of you remember the grumpy guys in the Muppet show. I'm talking grumpy. There's always something wrong and we grump, grump, grump. Let me challenge you to examine whether or not you are grace-filled Have you lost sight of God's grace and His truth? 
Have you lost sight of what he has done for you that you become judgmental of others and picky and negative towards everything that happens that discomforts you or you don't like? We need to come back to the grace of God and understand the depth and width of that if we are going to be persuasive witnesses for Christ. Because if our fruit is bitterness and anger and grumpy and grouchy, maybe we need to take a look and say, boy, maybe I have pulled away from the grace of God. Maybe I have been focused more on me than on Him and what He has done. Governor Festus, back in Acts 26, is one response that people may have to your message. But you may share Christ with them and they look at you and say, you're crazy. You are crazy for believing in this Christianity stuff. It's a crutch is what it is. And I say, if Christianity is a crutch, give me two. Because I do need him to hold me up. For those who do not think that they need a Savior, they will fall. They will be taken down by it. For we know how weak we are, how sinful we are. We need Christ. And I know to many who are not saved, it doesn't make sense at all. It doesn't seem to have any reason to it. How can you believe in a resurrection from the dead? That's for another time. For there is more evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ than any other event in the world, practically. But yet, people will deny it, reject it, and refuse to believe it. That is one response. The other response is from King Agrippa. It went from one that was being mad to really one that just kind of looked at it with disdain. There in verse number 28, you almost persuade me to become a Christian. You almost, you almost persuade me. Well, you know, you almost took that medication that would have spared your life, but you didn't. Did it have any saving ability if you don't take it? You almost took it. That's good, right? You almost took it. Uh, you can't almost take Christ. You can't. It's either you take him all or you reject him all. You can't be almost persuaded. It's either you are or you aren't. Why did King Agrippa probably refuse? It doesn't clearly state all those details in here, but let me give you some possibilities. One, King Agrippa was in an incestuous relationship with Bernice. It was his own sister. And he knew that if he received Christ as a Savior, he would probably have to break that relationship off, wouldn't he? Yes. If we are truly followers of Christ, we don't get to determine what is right and what is wrong. And when God clearly states, we must do what he says. Another possible reason was he didn't want to have mud on his face or embarrassment. He had just heard Festus say, man, are you insane? Well, what would that mean if Agrippa would have said, I believe what you're saying, Paul? Governor Festus would have looked at him and said, that makes two of you who are insane and crazy. How often do we refuse to accept Christ because we're more afraid of what somebody else will think? You almost persuaded me, but I don't want to be embarrassed Another one may be that he also feared losing his position. Notice after he says this, look at Paul's response, verse 29. Paul said, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me today might become both almost and altogether such as I am, except for these chains. Agrippa may have known that if he were to actually accept Christ as a Savior, it would be him in chains alongside of Paul. Because there's no way that the Jews would have allowed him or wanted him to actually lead them if he trusted in Jesus Christ as his Messiah. 
we look at our lives and we say, you know, I'm almost persuaded, but I may have to give up something. I may have to give up what I want. If you are an almost Christian today, do not let these things keep you from Him. Don't make excuses why today is not the day for your salvation. And let me take a moment and flip this to the other side. You're thinking to yourself, I can't be like the Apostle Paul. I'm not as good at witnessing as the Apostle Paul. Have you ever had anybody reject you? Congratulations, you're as effective as the Apostle Paul. It's not about the outcome. It's not about the production. It's not about the number of people you share Christ with, the number of people that come to know Christ as their Savior. It's the fact of, are you willing to be a witness for Jesus Christ? Are you willing to declare His name in those moments? God is not going to stand up there and say to you, okay, how many people actually came to know Christ after you shared me with them? He's more concerned about, were you a witness for me? Did you have a grace-filled life, a truth-filled life? Did you have a fruit-filled fruit -filled life? Were you filled with me so that you spoke of me with others? For you see, what we fail to see often in Paul's life is he was rejected more than he was accepted. He had more turndowns towards salvation than those who accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. But the thing about Paul was he was ready to proclaim Christ to whomever and whoever he was with. And the opportunity was available to him. I don't want us to fall into the trap that we think, well, I can't be like the Apostle Paul, therefore I won't. No. God wants you to be one of his pers persuasive witnesses for him. And where it starts is with the heart. Are you grace-filled? Examine your life. Or are you become judgmental of everyone around you? Are you truth-filled? Are you willing to speak the truth when you talk about Christ? And finally, is your life representing being a child of God? Are you fruit-filled? Let's pray. Father God, we come before you this morning. And Lord, there is much in this scripture that we could take time and probably dissect even more. But Father, I pray that we would be focused on these main thoughts. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I ask you whether you're saved or not saved, whether you are a Christian or you find yourself in King Agrippa's seat, where eh, almost, it sounds good, but I really don't know about making Jesus Christ the one who leads my life and tells me really what to do. If you're a Christian this morning, I want you to evaluate your heart. Those three areas that we've talked about, how are you doing? If there's some changes that need to take place, would you do it in the quietness of this moment? If you are not a Christian, would you pursue Christ today? Would you give yourself to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior today? Or will you remain like a King Agrippa? I'm pretty certain, died apart from Christ. Wishing that he would have became a Christian that day. 
Because almost is not enough. Maybe this whole message is kind of foreign to you about Christianity. Would you at least investigate it? Would you come and speak to myself, Pastor BJ, or someone else you know to be a Christian? Ask questions. Find out who this Messiah is. The Savior who wants to give you cleansing and forgiveness of your sin. He wants you to be in eternity with Him forever and ever and ever. Father God, we thank you again for this opportunity we have to open up your word. And Lord, I pray that we would truly do business with you. That we not take the words of this message and your words and just put them off to the side. But Lord, may we truly have a desire to be persuasive witnesses for you or to become a child of God. In just a moment, the praise and worship team is going to sing, and as they do, if you need to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior today, I, I'm going to ask you to do something that's I, I know it's going to be uncomfortable, especially in this day and age. But if you really want Christ as your Savior, would you come forward and say, hey, I want to know how to receive Christ as my Savior this morning. I don't want to put it off. We're making that invitation available to you to do so as they sing or immediately after the service. Come and don't leave today until you have the answers to those, that question. We don't want you to die apart from him. Don't be a King Agrippa being almost persuaded. Father, again, thank you for this wonderful time to open up your word. Be reminded of who you are and what you desire from us. We pray this in your name. Amen. I'm going to ask you to stand at this time as the praise and worship team comes and they sing nothing but the blood of Jesus. It is only through Jesus Christ that we can have salvation and forgiveness of our sin.
Well, as we close our time together, we want to give you just a couple of announcements or reminders. One is there's a small card in your uh, bulletin about baptism. We're having a baptism service next week. If you're interested in that, let us know immediately. Um, secondly, uh, we are uh, finishing up our Wednesday night services this week. So this will be our last one Wednesday night, but it will also be the resumption of choir practice. Yay! And so uh, we are excited for that and uh, hearing the choir. And uh, if you would like to be a member of the choir, please see Jeannie Hauser. She's here. And uh, let her know we would love to have you join us in that. Also, you'll see an announcement for the Calico Circle Ladies Bible Study. Uh, they are ordering books this week. So please see Diane Fulton if you would like to do that, or contact the church office, and we will do that uh, and let her know as well. So let's close our time together with a word of prayer. God, we thank you for this time. We thank you so much for your word and how clear it makes things. And uh, Lord, again, I pray uh, along with, with Pastor Craig and everyone here who is a Christian, that if there's anyone here that does not know you, that they will... Uh, humble themselves, repent from their sin, and turn to you, Jesus, because it's the most important fact, not only for their lives, but for all eternity. And Lord, I pray for those of us who are Christians that we would hear the message that was given, that we would be grace-filled, that we would be earnest, that, Lord, we would be salt and light, that we would not shrink back from sharing the gospel, but instead we would be a light in the darkness because, Lord, our nation seems oh so dark and so needful of Jesus Christ. May we be a good witness this week and may we be able to come back together and share with joy what you have done as a result. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.